He has a couple of other teacher announcements to make at that point in time. Uh, oh, no, excuse me, he has one other teacher announcement on uh, one of his other teachers. And then we also have an addition of information on text we can. And I'll have uh, Steve do that along with Rebecca at that same time. So probably under 6E, be 6A1, 6E1 will be Marguerite Lala Rohner. 2 will be Tra uh, Terry White. And uh, 3 will be uh, text we can. Thank you, Alan. Um, could I have a motion to approve the school board minutes from the regular school board meeting on Tuesday, September 8th? So moved. Thank you, Linda. Um, any comments, questions, um, corrections? Seeing none, all those in favor? 7 0. Thank you. Oh, okay. Is there someone who'd like to um, second, second that vote. before we vote on that? Oh, second. second. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> Thank you, Linda, for reminding me. I'm a little out of turn here. Okay, now would everyone like to vote on the second that we just had? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I apologize. Um, okay. Comments by our student representatives. Shall we start at the middle school? We have some new middle school representatives, so welcome. Hi, I'm Kate Bosworth. I'm Carolyn Kelly. And I'm Catherine Clark. And we're student representatives from the Student Council. Um, Catherine, Karen, and myself are here representing the Middle School Student Council. This year we ran elections for the 7th and 8th graders that wanted to be a part of the Student Council. The school president is Mackenzie Layton, who is backed by a great and moving speech about how much our school matters to her. The different positions we have in the Student Council this year are Secretary, who is John Keneally, Vice President, who is Catherine Clark, Treasurer, who is Lee Foden, and representatives from the 7th and 8th grades. We also allowed any 5th and 6th graders who wanted to take part in running our school. This year we are focusing on fundraisers. We are planning on doing the can drive that goes to the Preble Street Resource Center, box tops which are rewarding the students with the prize if they bring them in, and clink. The students have handed out clink bags to the students to fill. The school likes to run fundraisers because they give back to our community. One of the student council's many goals this year is to try to get our school involved in the community. At the Cumberland County Fair this year, the Life Skills Program, along with Pam Vos, had a great display in the Expedition Hall. They were showing the changes in the middle school garden. Another topic that the student council is helping with is Chiwonki. My grade almost did not get to go last year because of the budget cuts. Luckily, some donators stepped forward to help us scrape up the money. The last year's fifth grade noticed the problem and start, started fundraising right away. And the, students, the student council is helping the new fifth graders get ready so they will be able to have the great experience that the Chiwonki has to offer. I enjoy being a part of student council because you get to help your peers and have a good time. Hi, I'm Carolyn Kelly, and I'm here to talk about the upcoming events at CMS. Um, well, this isn't upcoming, but the kneecaps this year, uh, they were brand new to our school, and uh, I talked to some students, and they all pretty much agreed that um, they were a lot better than the MEAs, and they liked them. Uh, the book fair this year is uh, Thursday through the 23rd, and there's an early release the 22nd. Uh, there's no school the 23rd because of conferences, and the first dance for the 7th and 8th graders is the 22nd. Uh, the gardens, well, thank you to the parents who did them uh, to make our school even more beautiful. And uh, this year we have a wellness theme, and next month's is Understanding Depression, and there's a board out in the lobby talking about just what it's about. So, thank you. Hi, my name is Katherine Clark. I am Vice President of the Student Council for Cape Elizabeth Middle School. Tonight I'm here to talk to you about fall sports, the harvest lunch, and election day. We have a lot of participants in our fall sports programs. In field hockey, we have 17 7th graders and 14 8th graders. In girls soccer, we have 23 7th graders and 16 8th graders. In boys soccer, we have 23 7th graders and 21 8th graders. We have 53 boys and gir girls in 6th, 7th, and 8th grades running cross country. And in football, we have 32 boys playing 7th and 8th grade football. Fall sports will end between October 26th to October 30th. 
The Harvest Lunch was on September 17th and was a huge success. Kids loved the festivities and were very involved with the harvesting process. Thank you to all parents who made this event possible. And finally, a reminder, Election Day is on Tuesday, November 3rd. Your continuing support for the full funding of our schools is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for our new student representative? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that thorough report. Um, high school students, Matt and Julia. Um, well, I had a nice discussion with our um, student council, which is about 30 kids from all four grades, and we talked about um, a couple of possible changes to the substance abuse contract, um, which I'm sure will be under more discussion in the spring. Um, and the kids were also really interested in this year with the budget cuts that I'm sure are on their way um, to be more involved and have a louder voice in coming up with ideas. Um, because a lot of times the students can see things that we really may not need in the high school and could go first uh, versus things that are really important to our education. Um, yeah, just to add to what Julia said, I thought our student council meeting the other day was pretty productive in talking about what we'd like to accomplish this year. Um, last week we had Spirit Week, which I thought was a very big success, especially compared to the years I've been in the high school so far. It, I would say it was by far the most successful. And the next few weeks are going to be a little fragmented with testing and conferences, but other than that, it should be pretty good. Any questions for Julia and Matt? Thank you very much, both of you, for uh, I've heard great things about your, I think you're really doing a wonderful job in sort of interfacing for the school board with the students, so thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry. What? I'm going to let them know that they can go through them. You guys can leave if you would like. You're welcome to stay, but you can't leave if you would like. I'm sure you have lots of homework to do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, is there any members of the public who would like to speak on non-agenda items? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to recognition. Um, 2010 National Merit Scholarship Semifinalist and Commended Students. Is that you, Jeff? all three of them, Jeff, so we won't sit down. Until okay. <laughs> um, Semi-finalists uh, for the National Merit Competition are Laura Katsos and Carolyn Holland. Commended students, Devin Bottomley, Elizabeth Briggs, Peter Brigham, Jay Cushing, Sam Eisenberg, Graham Finley, Spencer Garland, J James Haller, and Catherine LaValle. And basically, for those of you who are not as familiar with it, is there, those, those positions are determined by how the kids do on the PSATs compared to how students do nationwide on the PSATs. Um, generally speaking, the semifinalists score in the top 1%, um, and the, the commended students score in the top few percent. The College Board has always been a bit fuzzy about exactly what percent that, that, that is, but um, certainly within the very top few percent of all the kids in the nation. So. It's a good, it's a really good join by our, by our members of the senior class who got those recognitions. So well, well deserved. Do you want me to stay up for these? Keep going. As well? Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> uh, school Spirit Week um, on Friday. What spoke to me about the success of the School Spirit Week more than anything else? Well, actually, Thursday night. I will say this. I've been through. We've done hallway decorating an awful lot of times at Cape Elizabeth High School. I have never seen as many students involved in those hallway decorating. I mean, there were, had to be 80 to 90 students in and out at various times. Um, and that is, that was, and they were just having a lot, a lot of fun. There was no raiding one another's hallways. Not seriously, anyway, there was some, and, um, and it, they had the student, the kids had a great time. And then on Friday when we had the assembly at the end of the day, um, um, we have also had students wear um, cape collars at uh, various homecomings and winterfests over the years, and I have never seen, number one, that many students there. Um, sometimes some students tend to fizzle out uh, because we don't hold them in, 
Um, and I would say virtually everybody was there and virtually everybody was dressed in class colors and they were all sitting sort of that way. It was very, very cool and the enthusiasm was great. I will say the key to it was there was a lot of really strong student leadership. Um, and Julia Springer was one of those major, major leaders. Um, um, but there were quite a few students who took a very, very, very active role in putting together Winterfest across the grade level. So I think it was really successful. Um, I don't know if there are any questions about that. But. I just wanted to add that I think I've heard wonderful things and I want to thank you as, a, as the administ administrator of the school for your support and also for those faculty members who did ease up a little bit on the homework and allow the kids to enjoy the week because I think part of the spirit week is community in the school and that takes everybody working together so uh, again I would like to reiterate Mr. Shedd's compliments to the SAC and all the students that got involved but also to the faculty members who supported the initiative. Yep. I would also single out Julian Moriarty and, um, and Jeff Thor who I was not involved at, uh, on as much a day-to-day -day basis I, as I have been in the past in those things and they just ran with it with the student leadership and sort of coordinating and channeling and it was really really successful. There were lots of folks in the SAC who were involved um, um, and lots of members of the junior class. I think it was a real unifying thing, especially for the members of the senior class and junior class for different reasons. Um, but I think it was particularly successful for those groups. Um, high school student leadership program. This is a pilot program that Jeff Thorick and I have organized. Um, and, and we are learning with students as we, walk, as we work through the process. The goals of the program are really to um, take students who either have leadership positions in the school or who have been identified by staff members or coaches as having the potential to exhibit strong leadership and really sort of breaking down and trying to do some training around um, developing, developing leadership skills, particularly around communication and dealing with tough issues and those sorts of things. Um, we did, uh, Jeff and I did seek nominations from teachers and coaches and took all those um, and then did a very difficult job of, of identifying 33 students, um, about equally divided between sophomores, juniors and seniors because we have lots of wonderful students and, and we wanted to provide opportunities to a lot but we also recognized that our capacity to sort of deal with students um, was, was limited so we had to work around some constraints. And we were also in the process of, in, in, while we were doing that, um, the mission, the goal, or our vision, I should say, of this program is over several years, if we can get a program to succeed and sustain over a period of several years, is really to begin to work on a more, uh, on school cultural issues um, and, and students being willing um, to step aside from the majority um, and be willing to talk to other students but in the, in the process of putting together a group one of the things that Jeff and I both felt very strongly was necessary is to get a group of kids who, um, who were drawn from various social groups within the school. Um, so one of the first challenges that we are dealing with I think in the first couple of meetings is just getting that group of kids to work together successfully and just to gel together. There are, there are leadership challenges within the team of kids in terms of just getting the group to um, buy into certain norms and that sort of stuff. Um, but I, I see a lot of potential. I actually think one very small piece of why the Spirit Week was successful was because um, some of those kids um, that as I looked around um, the um, Spirit Week assembly I saw a number of student leaders who in the past I know have not attended those sorts of things and they were there. Um, um, actively involved and participating in that sort of thing and I, again I'm, I'm not I'm saying that was, that was a very tiny piece a very tiny piece but I, it gave me some encouragement that um, perhaps we're heading in the right direction we are working with ripple effect uh, which is based on Cow Island in Casco Bay for those of you who are familiar with that they do executive leadership trainings for corporations and schools and a whole bunch of different folks and they've been good to work with and and the first day um, our group of students um, went out to Cow Island and then we've since had one of our, we've had one meeting um, um, at school but the folks from Ripple Effect are coming back so that there will be a continuing presence for us. Um, we are learning, um, we will make mistakes um, and again I, I really see it as 
planting the seeds for something that I hope can take root in over over a period of years if we can begin to have some successes with it. So that's really what it is. We put we we give kids a lot of leadership positions, but we don't really do a lot to sort of train them in what it takes to be an effective leader. So that's really what the goal is. I don't have any questions about that. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, communications, athletics update, is that? Yes, uh, Jeff Thorak will probably be here later, later but I have a couple of things I do want okay. to say about it. Is first of all, under uh, athletics update, uh, if you'll remember, we have a school policy where we meet at least two times a year with the boosters. We had our first meeting two or three, three, three weeks ago, I think it was, just reviewing where we are at this point, the rules and regulations. One of the pieces that was stressed is we need to get evaluations of coaches out. And if you saw your emails today, I think you all got it. Those evaluations have gone out to all of the coaches. And so I'm saying this publicly so that the public will take time to, to give their uh, feedback about this athletic events. Hopefully a lot of positive feedback, but if there are concerns, to put those down at the same time, because that's one of the ways we know how our programs are running and what we may need to look at again. So those are in the hands of the booster uh, chairs. They're getting them out to all the parents. And so if you are sitting on this uh, board and you haven't received it in the next week, please make sure you check to be sure you do. And I would say the same thing to the parents in the community so that you have a chance to uh, give some input on that. And when Jeff gets here, I'll also have him give a quick update on the athletics uh, for this fall. Thank you, Alan. Uh, maintenance department summer work. You have in your packet a fairly long list. Uh, Bob McVean, as you remember, is the person who is uh, now overseeing maintenance while Ernie is doing a specific work for the town and school department in big uh, projects. And so what we did have Bob do is, Rob do is send on a list of things they completed this summer because I think it's always important for you to know that our maintenance of the buildings is a year-to-year -year basis and we don't hold off things and we aren't canceling things because we know they need to be done. I won't read this whole list to you, but if you notice going down through it, the painting of the high school gym, which was a major project uh, because of the floor and the work that needs to be on, done, repair the therapeutic restraints in the room in the 30s building, uh, blowing out the heating units at the high school building, a therapeutic restraint room at the high school, Re relocating book storage at the high school, rehabilitating the town of Cape Elizabeth pool, uh, clean out all glass traps in science and art room, resurfacing middle school door painting, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of work was completed this summer by the maintenance department. And I do remind everyone when we talk about them that the maintenance department does work for both the town and the school. And so they complete projects in both areas during the summer. And the four men who are on that crew uh, work hard to make sure everything is taken care of. So I do thank them for that. Thank you, Alan. Um, flu clinics. I would tell you, I, I, for those of you who are parents in the community, uh, we did our first flu clinic. Uh, it went quite well. We had almost 50% of the students in uh, Cape Elizabeth who did participate. Uh, we have, you have in your booklet the list of volunteers. We had a large number of volunteers for the flu clinic, and special thank yous have gone out to them. But I do need to say that uh, it was the most coordinated event I've ever seen. They were so good. The, the volunteers worked hard with us. Uh, they uh, got the high school kids for us and had a chance to do that. Then we moved to the middle school. Uh, we did, uh, it slowed down a little bit. It took us a, l a little longer than planned to get through the middle school. Pond Cove parents and students were waiting out front. They were very patient as we worked our way through. And then we brought them in and finished them up. And we were done, uh, except for our last few that came in at the last minute, we were done at 2.30, which I think was darn good for the number of people that we had to do. We did run out of some vaccine. Uh, they contacted uh, Portland, and more vaccine was brought in so we could do everyone that came to have it done. We are scheduled, and I say this carefully, as long as H1N1 comes in as predicted, we are scheduled to do students on the 30th of October, the day before Halloween. Uh, so <laughs> and I knew everybody would be thrilled to hear that. But in my conversation at Maine Medical Center today, what I did find out is the uh, seasonal flu vaccine is still not coming in in the moments they would like to have it. 
So if there are people who want to have H1N1 on the 30th, students who did not get the seasonal, they can still have the H1N1 separately. So we, we are not sending anything out to parents yet until we can be absolutely sure. We know that some vaccine has arrived in the state, and that's being used for emergency personnel right now. And as soon as we know, by the middle of next week, if it has come in, then letters will go out to all parents. I think in the meantime, we have all of the forms ready to go, all of the informational letters ready to go. And it, again, will be both a mist and a vaccination. So we'll have both at that point in time. However, if we do end up getting the seasonal flu piece and some students need it, you can only take one mist at a time. And then so if they want both, it would be a mist and a vaccination. So it would be a com combination of both. But uh, it's working really well. I cannot thank enough uh, the people who came up from Saco who did the workshop for us and did the uh, did the injections and also some uh, people from the community who are doctors who came in and helped us as well. Uh, again, the list is very long. I don't, know, I don't know if you want me to read it or not, but I would mention at the very end of the list, we also have four doctors in the area who have given donations of finances to help us pay for the extra cost of some of the equipment we have needed. So uh, we do thank Dr. Dan DeSena, Dr. David Winberg, and Dr. Jeff Safer for donations that they have made towards us. We received an all over $1,300 worth of donations, which has been very helpful. And I don't know if you want to do the entire list of uh, volunteers. Or What's the sense? People sense. No? OK. Any other questions on, for Ellen on clinics? Thank you for all your work on I, that. I, I should say one more thing. Uh, the nurses, our three school nurses, have been wonderful through this whole process. And I particularly want to thank our newest nurse, uh, Cindy Tardiff, who came in this year. And she really had oversaw everything. She made all the contacts. She did everything she could snap her fingers and take care of the next step along the way. And I did stay there for the entire pro uh, process from the beginning to the end. And so I get a chance to see everyone. And I thought Cindy had a, a well working machine and the other two nurses working really hard with her to make sure it went very well. Thank you, Alan. Oh, question? Um, I just want to make a comment. I went through, I got the vaccine, and I was amazed how well the system was working. It was like I was expecting going in that I would be in there for an hour and waiting in line. And I was like, in shot, wait, go. <laughs> yeah, I was, like, I was like, I could miss more class, but um, I was really. <laughs> I just thought I would match for you. <laughs> thank you, Julia, for sharing that, um, and thank you, Ellen, and as well as the nursing staff and all of these volunteers for helping to make that happen. Um, let's go, Karen. I think you want to give a quick follow-up from our presentation from last month. And I promise it will be brief. Um, as you all know, Let's Go came last week and gave us an update. And I think there were some good questions that were asked by some of the school board members, um, specifically sort of the purpose of the presentation and what were they really asking for. And I figured that was a fair question, so I called Heidi at Let's Go. I'm just like, okay. Just sum it up in a few things. What, what sort of the bottom line of the presentation in addition to what you're all about and what we're doing? And she left me with these thoughts. Um, to please pay attention to what is happening around wellness and to notice the good things. So as a board, to be cognizant of that. Um, to please provide leadership and visible support. This is especially important when implementing changes when there's pushback. So another point well taken. Um, to encourage the superintendent and the DLT, especially the administrators, Tom and Steve and Jeff, see if any of them look up, um, to assume a leadership role in supporting the wellness initiatives. For example, this, the school nutrition progress is not just about the cafeterias. It's about what happens in the classrooms, other places in the school, at the snack shacks, et cetera. So the administrative support is critical. And basically, the bottom line is being on the same page and functioning as a supportive team. So really, just asking us to come on board with that, I think, was their primary mission. So thank you all for listening and continuing to be supportive. Rebecca? Um, I had asked if we could get a hold of um, specifically some of the slides that she had. And she said, we actually could get, get you the whole presentation. So I'm wondering if we've had a chance to get that from them. 
I could definitely get. I think she said the slides were on the website that you could access. But if you want the whole presentation, let me let me email her and request yeah. that we get the full presentation. My thought is is that perhaps if we could share it with booster groups and other community sports groups that have snacks and uh, shacks and organized snacks after games, that that might be a handy yeah. tool to share. Yeah, sports and other, yeah, extracurricular. And other extracurricular, exactly. yeah. you're right. I shouldn't just focus on that. No, that's great. Thank you. I will do that. Any other questions or follow-up? Thank you, Karen, for following up on those. Um, Marguerite Lalarona. Uh, Steve? And then I guess, Steve, you can stay because you have a few other things. <laughs> Okay, Mark uh, Alan, you forgot to mention that Cindy also made great chocolate chip cookies that she had out right. back. Right. That's right. And uh, in, the, in the maintenance piece also, I don't know if, you've had, if everybody's had the opportunity to walk through the middle school yet, but if you haven't been into the gym, go check that out because of the resurfacing of the floor. John Casey and Andy Strout did a lot of background work to try to figure out, okay, what was the gym originally like in 62, I think it was. What, what was the floor there? So they actually uh, did a throwback. Um, John says that really wasn't his senior year, but whatever. He seems to remember what the floor looked like. And uh, also, if you go through the gym lobby in the World, uh, World Language Office now, you no longer need an umbrella this year because there was a roofing company that came in. That was just an incredible area to go through prior to that. Okay, on to uh, Marguerite. Marguerite um, applied for an opportunity that there were there, there are over 1,000 candidates for. And in the write-up it says that 16 were chosen. It's actually 18, but 18 out of 1,000 and only one teacher from the state of Maine and I think only two from New England. Um, so this is, this is what the arrangement is. She's been accepted into a one-year program, Museum in Your Classroom, Teaching Art Online, through the, main, uh, through the uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. The program's goal is to cultivate a dynamic and productive community of learners who will comprise the MFA teaching with technology. The participants chosen from the highly competitive pool represent a wide range of grade levels, K-16, to in all subject areas taught. Marguerite is the only main educator of the applicants chosen to participate in this unique opportunity. The course introduces educators to the hands-on realities of using online technology to incorporate art into the classroom curriculum. Using MFA educators online, teachers will learn principles and practices of online learning and teaching with art. Throughout the year-long course, guest presenters, including educational media developers, area scholars in the field of computer web-based learning and cognition, and museum curators, conservators, and educators will bring varied perspectives to the endeavor. Class participants will gain real-world experience through applying their new skills and knowledge to mentoring and coaching peers and trying new techniques in the classroom. So we're very excited for the opportunity that Marguerite is going to bring to the, to the school related to embedded technology. And she'll be traveling to Boston one, uh, once a month for classes at the museum, and we'll meet her fellow participants there. Um, and her work is going to connect to social studies, art, and language arts in an integrated approach for the second year in a row. First piece. Do you want me to continue with a questions? Can I just make a comment? Yeah. She is probably one of the most extraordinary art teachers I have come across. And when you see the impact she has in the classroom and how she works with the other teachers and some of the exciting things she's working on, uh, she, she is an inspiration. So we are very lucky to, to have her. Yeah, our, our game happened to be Westbrook's loss because she was Teacher of the Year for the state of Maine and working in the Westbrook schools, and then, lo and behold, she was hired in Cape Elizabeth. So we're, we're very fortunate to have her. Um, she brings in her students from uh, a Mecca course that she teaches. There, there are four or five student teachers in there at, at any given time, and she also brings in um, local artists and craftsmen to demonstrate to students how people do these kinds of things for a living and, and what can what can come from it. And she's a great grant writer. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, moving on to Terry White. All right. Terry and I had a conversation this morning because he has a a, a really unique uh, 
um, uh, accolade that he just received. Um, <clears throat> Terry White was recently contacted by a band director from Willis Junior High School in Chandler, Arizona. The director wanted to let Terry know that the Firebird Band, their junior high band, will be playing one of Terry's original tunes, Past My Bedtime, which Terry wrote in 2007. They're going to present this piece at the Midwest International Band and Orchestra Clinic. And you might just say, what the heck is that exactly? Terry asks to go to this every year. He says, I'm, I'm paying it out of pocket. All I need is the time from school to go to this. And it's been operating for the past 60, 60 years, and the conference takes place in December this year in Chicago, and it features selected middle school, high school, college, and community bands and choruses. Approximately 15,000 directors from as far away as Japan and Australia will attend, will attend this annual conference. It's a rare honor for a school to receive an invitation to play at the conference. That's one piece. While we don't have anybody playing, we're in good company. There has never been a New England band or chorus in 60 years invited to participate in this conference. One from Texas every year, but Maine never gets <laughs> New England doesn't get in. <laughs> Um, Terry, Terry said, if you haven't got four tubas, forget it. Um, so while no New England school has ever been uh, present at that, uh, Terry is helping put New England on the map through the honor of his tune being selected, which is uh, a, indeed a, a rare feat. So congratulations to Terry White. Another great person at the middle school. Yes, I would just echo that. But maybe we want to have Terry White um, tap into Marguerite's grant writing skills so he can get four tubas and get invited to go to the, have the band go. I'm sure you'd have kids that would want to go. Well, he has a certain philosophy about that. Um, when we were talking today, he's, his take is, if the kids want to try the different instruments, they've got plenty of time to try it. Why do you want to force this on kids at elementary and middle school levels to say, you've got to play the tuba. He's, <laughs> you don't play the tuba, we're not invited. Terry's like, let them develop at their own rate. So. Yeah, but we have a lot of talented musicians, students, students in this school system. I bet there'd be four who might want to try the tuba. We do. He, he tried to explain to me the difference in this kind of an activity because he said one of the, one of the clinic um, workshops you can go to is uh, about how, how to select the, um, the oboe with the best something or other. And Terry's going, the best oboe? Just give me an oboe. <laughs> Okay, um, any other questions, comments? Okay, text we can. Okay, as you're uh, aware, um, for the past, and this is my fifth year, so my uh, second, third, fourth budgets that I presented, <laughs> I'd produce a little chart and say, our textbooks are getting older. They're not between 10 and 22 years now. They're between 13 and 26 years. And, and uh, a couple of my favorites were the Voyage of the Mimi with nine-year-old Ben Affleck and the uh, science text from 1983 that was being used in the sixth grade that I actually handed to a student in 83. Those were a couple of my favorite examples. Um, I think Talk Everlasting ran out of life. Uh, there are several resources that just weren't making it any. Have you read Talk Everlasting? Yes. Okay. No joke. It wasn't, uh, that book didn't last as long as the story. So um, there are a lot of resources that needed uh, attention. And when I got to the school, I realized that um, when, I was, when I first came back to the middle school, that the, it appeared as though the textbook cycle of replacement had probably stopped about 10 to 12 years before I came back. So, and it was plain to see that through attrition and budgets that that was a large target number that could take a hit and not uh, interfere with staffing and programming and things like this. So over time it dwindled to where um, last year at the beginning of the year I mentioned to people I would need a 25 year textbook cycle at the rate of the amount that's in there right now to completely overhaul our resources. So um, I think that some people had, had had enough of listening to me about that. So a, a group of parents, uh, Rebecca being uh, one of the the person who got this off the ground and running for us 
um, decided that they were going to form a, a task force, this uh, Text We Can group, and they developed a mission statement. They had uh, regular meetings, um, very businesslike, ready to go, knew all the pieces that they wanted to put in place to, to get this off the ground. And when they first said, look, you know, we're, our goal is to raise $60,000, and we're looking at the school to match funds out of 09 and, and, and the 10 budget, this is 60000 not 6000 You're talking $60,000. Okay, I'll have to see this one. So, <clears throat> very interesting to watch the, the entire process. And as of probably a week ago, that goal was reached. So, I believe it's a total of about 61500 maybe a little bit more than that, uh, that, that um, the community uh, offered as donations to this group. And so, with those funds, we have um, completely overhauled the resources to go along with the new curriculum for science and for world language particularly. And the, the, the change from what a textbook idea was in 1983 or 1996, which was the uh, world language resource, it's their night and day. The embedded technology components in that that match up really well I'm saying? Okay, that matched up really well with uh, um, our State of Maine's one-to-one -one laptop technology initiative. It's just perfect. What a, what a blend. And we still have plenty of uh, science links and gizmos, and we have uh, the, uh, still have the Gaia the, uh, website that's used for, for world language. But absolutely wonderful resources uh, that we'll be able to put in the hands of our students that are contemporary, that actually when you open up the science book it doesn't say, look at the development of this product, we're going to call it Dacron. <laughs> I don't think we don't use that anymore, do we? So uh, we have human biology and health resources uh, inside the earth, electricity and magnetism, cells and heredity, chemical interactions, motion forces and energy. We have uh, replaced the newest edition of the transition math text, which we could not um, find the previous edition anymore. Um, we got lucky we had roots a couple of years ago because we were able to, to uh, pull in a good supply of those, but um, they have a shelf life and you can't get training in it anymore through the Chicago program either because they're only training in the most up-to-date resource. We also uh, purchased some pre-transition, uh, which is for the, um, uh, the accelerated class in the fifth grade, and we're toying around to say what will that look like in the sixth grade. We have the um, world language French and Spanish resources. Um, we have uh, literature anthologies to do short story work in the, in the middle school to teach liter elements of literature. So it, it's, it's very exciting to see all of these things come together at the same time the work that the curriculum instruction and assessment team has been doing, coupled with resources to allow you to do those things. It's just, it's great. So a huge thank you to all the donators and to the uh, group of parents who pulled together to make this happen. Any other comments? I might just um, mention those individuals who served on the committee and other people who were very instrumental in, in helping the effort. Um, so the, the members of the Text We Can Committee, I'd like to um, thank them for their many hours of work starting last winter, I believe, is when the first meeting started. Carolyn Flaherty, Ann Ingalls, Kathy Lawaldi, Patty Grennan, Lori Stewart, Hulda Khalidi um, were the Text We Can Committee members. Um, a big thank you to Ann Gale for helping with the website and Sarah Lennon for her amazing work on the brochures. Pauline, for your work with following the money, and I believe Sally, T Sally has been working yes, in Sally your office Tamaro. and sending out thank yous and, and tracking also. So, um, and thank you both to, to you, Steve, and to you, Alan, for working with us and making this a, a reality. Um, I have to say that personally, it's, a, it's a, a little bittersweet in the sense that we were able to raise this money, but that we actually had to do it in the first place. Um, and it is a one-shot deal. We do not plan on doing this. Now that the middle school is back on track, we are hopeful that it can maintain a much more robust text um, book replacement cycle. Um, 
but I do know what's coming down the pike in at least the next year, so hopefully we're going to be in good shape for a year or so before we have to yeah. start making major investments again. Yeah. And we have uh, some of the resources, the, the technological components that go with that are six or seven year cycles. So, for instance, it, we can't end up in a situation again where the uh, sixth grade is going to be using the 1983 text. There won't be one to use, for instance, in the seventh and eighth grade. When that, when that um, uh, software site license is up, we've gone electronic with the resource. It has to be replaced. So we hope not to be in that same position again. Anybody else? I would just like to add um, to the thank you to Rebecca um, for all of her work in sort of getting it up and running and um, seeing it through to its fruition. And again, on behalf of the board, to thank those individuals and all of those who donated to the, who didn't work on the committee, but also donated in, in for supporting our students and our, our public schools. So thank you. Um, let's see. District adequate yearly progress status. Yes. Uh, what you have in your uh, packet uh, three letters, one to Pond Cove, one to the middle school, and one to the high school, regarding the MEAs and the adequate yearly progress that is made with those. Um, as you know, we have been working diligently for the last year to develop a data processing program. Uh, we hired somebody to set that up. Part of that program, only a part, is the MEA uh, work that we have been doing. But it's important for you to see we will later on this year do a full presentation on some of the data and how it works without giving student names so that you can see some of the things that have been happening. But I did bring these reports because I think it's important for you to see them. The first one is from Pond Cove. And if you look at the, the back of the first page, you'll see that in reading, we made the AYP. In other words, we were successful. We reached the level we were supposed to in all target areas and uh, in uh, 09 and again in 910. <clears throat> Remembering that the target areas are uh, 12 of them, I believe. The first one is average daily attendance. If you don't have 95% of your students in place, why you lose credit for that. Uh, graduation rates from the high school, whole group, economically disadvantaged students with disabilities, limited Eng English proficiency, Asian Pacific Islanders, black African Americans. Caucasian, Hispanic, American Indian, and Native American in small schools. Uh, we don't fit in most of those categories because you have to have a certain percent of your students who fit in those. We only fit in a couple of those categories. But if you look at the math, you will see in 2008 and 9 we made AYP. In 2009, our progress targets were not met. And so at this point in time, we are on a monitor basis. The targets that were not met, as it says here, is under S, which is students with disabilities. And so we did have students who did not make the target. The rest of the students did. Uh, special education is taking a look at those. We have a separate test we do so that we can understand the difference. I think one other thing is really important for you to understand. Number one, that MEA will not be here this coming year, this year. But number two is that what they do is set a goal that once your school performs at a certain level, and you must show a percent growth each year. So if you set a goal that was at this level, then you have to have that percent there. If your goal is at this level from performance in the past, then you have to go to here. And so our performance overall was very, very high. But because it was so high, our performance level to make that next step with our limited, with our identified students was not met. And so we had had that same issue happen at middle school. Uh, some very specific work was done in that area, and that was improved. And so we are at the stage of doing the same thing at Pine Cove. If you look at the next page, at the middle school, they made the AYP both uh, in math and reading for this year. And if you look at the high school, uh, they also made AYP in reading and math. So we, we, have, we do very well because our students perform so high. But we also run into the problem of you, sometimes it is hard to make that next adjust, adjustment up, particularly in with some of your subgroups. And we do have uh, very few subgroups that we can deal with. And those are average daily attendance. Obviously, we do look at graduation rate at high school. 
We do uh, limit uh, students with disabilities. We also do limited English proficiency, and as you can see, our LLD, uh, LL, yeah, limited English proficiency students did make it. We don't do most of the uh, ethnic groups because we don't have high enough population, except obviously Caucasian, and I believe also we do just barely meet the line for black and African Americans, and we are not small schools, so we don't fit in that category. So this is a piece of the big puzzle, and we will eventually this year bring in information that will show the comparison of this with DRA at the lower grade level, with NWEA at Pond Cove, third, fourth, and all of the middle school and uh, one of the grades at the high school. You look at SATs, the PSATs, and all of those pieces. But this is an important piece. If you'll remember a few years ago when this first started, it was reported on the front page of the newspaper, and every school was listed, whether you made AYP or did not make AYP. That did end, but the information is still very important for the public to understand. And we will have a new reporting system this year as a result of the new testing that we're about to do. Rebecca? <clears throat> Alan, am, is it correct that by the year 2014, the No Child Left Behind law will require that 100% of our students meet expectations? Uh, has this been discussed among superintendents and the Department of Education? Because that's not that far from now. Um, and so what are they planning on? There's no way you're going to get 100% of your students. This law was written to design to make public schools fail. It, it truly is. And I mean, this is the discussion we have had over the years, is that it is. It's designed there has to be a point where every school will not make annual yearly progress. And we're very aware of that. And there are many schools at this point who are not doing that. You have some high schools in the state who have not made it for four years. Uh, so that does happen. The discussion of it, I will be really honest with you, has kind of died down. Because when that first started back uh, 10 years ago, probably, uh, or more, uh, the, the feeling that was the only thing we had. It was the only documentation we had. Now all of us have moved into a different range of information, and we're looking at a broader range of things. So our feeling is, is that when you, as we get to 2014, as with everything else that happens on these regulations, it will change and will be based on some other pieces of the puzzle. And I don't know, I, I'm really interested in seeing how the new evaluation, which is MECAP, which is used in several New England states, how that result is going to be different than what we see right now in that process. So that the 2014 is not the issue of discussion uh, that it used to be. And so people believe nothing's going to happen. But I think so. I think that's fair. I think that's a fair statement to make. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, consolidation referendum question. The next, three, the next three, really, I'm going to talk about briefly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but uh, I have been, the newspapers have been after me for the last two weeks on all of these issues around freezing budget, uh, what is going to happen financially, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought I would speak to it briefly tonight. Uh, several, a couple of newspapers called me again today to find out where we are. So the first thing I'll talk about is the consolidation referendum question. And I'm not going to speak to the consolidation referendum question in favor or to oppose it, just to talk about what it does. As you know, as you'll remember a few years ago, uh, Cape Elizabeth and Yarmouth fell in a very different position than most schools in the state. And because we are a high performing and a very efficient school system, we were allowed to stand alone as a school system. So we are, in Cape Elizabeth and in Yarmouth, standing alone as an individual school system. The third school system was Falmouth, who petitioned after that, it all happened, and they finally were granted the petition so that there are now three of us who stand alone in this process. So a vote on consolidation in the big picture will not affect us one way or the other. However, if you look closely at the picture, what you will find is, is that when consolidation came into being, and you remember the law we kept going over and over and over, the very thick book that we had, that consolidation law took place of the funding laws that had stood at, up to that point. 
So what we're very clear on, if consolidation is rejected in the vote, there will have to be some serious changes and reviews of the law to see how funding will occur in school systems. If it remains, we, there are still those issues because you still do not have 100% regional uh, units. You have many towns that never have voted in favor of becoming a part of a unit. They voted against it. So the question remains and the question that is being discussed over and over again is should this be passed, shouldn't it be passed? What is the picture and what should it look like? And at this point in time, what I am hearing across the state is the, the yes, leave it the way it is, as opposed to those who want to see it change a lot of go, is about even. So where that's all going to take place, I don't know. But I think the bigger issue in Cape Elizabeth that we have to pay attention to is if it doesn't pass, what does that mean for the amount of funding we would continue to get from the state? As you know, our funding is based on basically two pieces of the puzzle. One is property value as it is reassessed by the state. And the second is the number of students we have in the school system. As you remember, over the last two years, we have lost money in the process of general purpose aid to education. And the reason we've done that is that even though our property values have been falling, we get two-year-old numbers. And so they have used two-year-old numbers for the last two years to figure the amount of money we'll get. This year, uh, for, uh, for 10-11, hopefully, if they don't change the formula, as our property value falls, we have lost some students too, but not enormous percentages. We hopefully would get a little more money. I don't know how that's going to play out between, yes, there is a consolidation rule, which we are considered a consolidated school, even though we stand alone, or a non-consolidated school. And so those issues are going to be issues that are going to be very difficult for the legislature to deal with if it is voted down, if they vote out regional school systems because there are going to be some serious discussions held in towns across Maine. And I think the one that we probably hear the most about is Freeport and what happened with the consolidation of regionals program in Freeport, where Freeport is paying less in taxes to run their schools, but the towns that uh, went in with them are paying up to 25% more in taxes. Those are issues that are out there. Those are issues that have not been resolved. The, the initial vote on this really came from small school systems across the state, also came from school systems which are spread out over large territories, particularly in Washington and Arista County. But the, the final vote will affect all school systems. And the bottom line of the effect, we don't know what it will be. We know if it stays in place as it is now, the question becomes the towns that did not vote to become a regional school system. We're originally supposed to be fined for not doing that. We're originally supposed to lose monies for not doing that. That plan was set aside, if you remember, this spring. And so it hasn't happened at this point. So how that will all play out, I don't know. On the other side of the coin, if the law is changed so that regional school systems are not mandatory, Will some school systems stay as regional school systems? Some are saying it's working really well for them, and some are saying it is not. Or will they dissolve from there? What it really leads to is some serious problems and decision making by the legislators as this happens and how that will all look as we go down the road. Rebecca. Didn't we receive a bulletin from Maine School Management Association um, basically saying that should the consolidation law be repealed, we would revert to the previous, law, the previous laws and that there was no vacuum. But that's what they had said in the beginning when we first got that. As they have reviewed, when the law was passed, the new law, the new understanding is that that rescinded the old law and so that that would have to be, they'd have to do some reworking of that entire piece. So if you, and a good example, let's go back to Cape Elizabeth again. If you remember in the beginning when Cape Elizabeth became an individual district, it was said we would, have, we would go three years and then we would have to reassess it. And then the commissioner spoke to the legislature and said, 
we've changed our minds. Cape Elizabeth and Yarmouth at that point in time will stay as they are as long as they want to stay. They'll take a vote of the towns to move out of that process. So a lot of this is still very much up in the air. But uh, in my understanding and talking with Maine School Management in the last couple of weeks is there is still, it is still extremely unclear what will happen if this is a vote against consolidation. And I just want to be careful when I say that. I'm not here to get votes for either in favor or against, but to only say it opens up some issues that they'll have to deal with as time comes on, goes on. The other um, question I would, I would, I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask it anyways. When they granted the um, high-performing, efficient exemption, did they ever define specifically how they arrive at those qualifications? It is in the report that we got at that point in time. Uh, there is very, it's very specific on how, what they did for data gathering and what they were using as MEA scores over a, I think it was three year period. And so that's what they used at that point in time. So then potentially the fact that we did not meet AYP for Pond Cove should anybody want to make an issue out of that in our status? That could be done. Under, under the current law. Yeah, that could be done. The, what we're going on is, is what we hope was a guarantee from the commission that uh, that will not be a fact. It. We never got it in writing. No. We never did. As much as we requested that. <coughs> so, so the baseline is, is this is, a, this is going to be a tricky uh, decision making and what will happen after the third will be interesting to see how it all plays. Thank you, Alan. Any other questions or <coughs> comments on that? Okay. Um, stimulus funds. Number two is stimulus funds. <coughs> I'm going to take stimulus funds and current uh, finances together so I can try to explain this to you as best as possible. I've had several newspaper reporters say to me at the end of my discussion with them, I think I understand this better, but I'm not sure. So let me see what I can do. Yeah. Uh, First of all, what, I need, what we need to talk about is two sets of budgets. One is the budget we are currently in. That's the 9-10 budget, 2009-2010. The other budget I'll talk about will be the 2010-2011 budget, which is the budget we are going to be building in the next few months. But I first want to take a look at 2009 and 10. What happened during the fiscal year 08-09 as you'll remember, we did not, we took a reduction of $421,000 in 08-09, if you remember that. And what happened was the governor had spoken about doing the reduction. It was finally done, and it took out that $421,000. At the same time, the stimulus money became available. So if you'll remember, we took the stimulus money which was available which was $421,000. We used that money to offset the loss that we were going to get by the governor's reduction at that point in time. What happened is then we, took a, we had to take a look at the budget. We had to decide, OK, of the $421,000 you're using in stimulus money, what did that save you from losing in your school budget? So what we had to do is go through the school budget, take a look at it, decide what we would have lost, and list those things that we could have lost. For instance, I use one example right off the top. <coughs> Excuse me. And I use the example only because it was one that was a fairly large one. We looked at it, the Achievement Center. The Achievement Center is a fairly expensive program. And so when we had $421,000 lost, we used the Achievement Center as a piece of that puzzle and what we talked about. Excuse me again. We also looked at other pieces to the puzzle and what that was. But basically, I came out of eight and nine without a loss and didn't have to make that big cut at that point in time because of the stimulus package. Now we're at nine ten. If you will remember correctly, in the beginning, we took a $1.2 million loss in GPA. With that loss, what became available to us was $699,000 uh, in stimulus money. 
What we had to do is take a look at our budget as it was. What that $699,000, what would we save by using that piece? You'll also remember that we went back and looked at the remaining amount up to $1.2 million. We used some of the savings we got from the zero increase in the uh, health insurance as part of it. Uh, we received from the town $200,000 from their unexpended balance. We did some uh, cuts, particularly at Tech Ones, but we still did not make the full loss. And so at that point in time, instead of coming into the town council at a zero base budget, we voted on, we came in with a 0.6% increase. And that became the 910 budget. Now we're in October. We have heard from the commissioner and we heard from our legislators who we met with the other day that we will probably get another cut from the governor, which will probably be no less than $421,000, but could be as much as double that, or $800,000. Now, here's where our problem lies, is that for 9-10, there is no more stimulus money available. There is stimulus money for the 10-11 budget, which they keep telling us is you're kind of on the edge of the precipice at that point, ready to fall off because there will be so many issues. So the question will be, can part of the 10-11 stimulus be moved over to 910 in order to offset some of that possible cut. We're warned by the commissioner, we're warned by the legislators, is that if we do that, then we'll leave less money, if any money, for our 10 and 11 to take care of the loss that we'll get. So the question comes down in 910, once the decision is made, now what I understand is no decision will be made until after the election on November 3rd because there are several bills in the legislature will make differences in what towns can expect for finances, et cetera. The sense is that somewhere after November 3rd, there will probably be an announcement from the governor about what will be cut because of the losses the state is suffering at this point. If it, is, if it comes to the $421,000, for instance, if we don't have stimulus money, I don't think I'm going to tell you anything that will surprise you and that I don't have $421,000 in money that is not tied up in some kind of services at this point in time. Because we wrote what I consider a very tight budget. Even though some people don't agree with me, I still think we wrote a very tight budget. So then we're going to have to look at other possibilities, which will be programs, people, services, and how we will manage that. Now, when we come into the 10-11, have I lost you all yet? No. When we come into the budget for 2010-2011, what we are being told is that if we lost 1.2 million this year for 9-10, we could probably lose that much again for 10-11. Now, if our property value has dropped and our loss of students is not as broad as it could be, we may get some more money but there's no guarantee of that at this point. So when they keep saying the precipice, I've talked with superintendents all across the state, we're all looking at losses uh, anywhere from one million to three to four million dollars in our budget planning for 10 and 11. So the question that remains for me, the question that remains for all of us as superintendents to report back to you as board members is, where will these monies come from? The first step is what, if we get the $421,000 cut in 910 or a larger one that could be up to double that or around $800,000, where will we come up with that money? If stimulus money from 10 and 11 can be used at 910 and perhaps we can defray some of that or all of it, but then when we build 10 and 11, what will we be planning on as far as losses in our money situation at that point in time? So what it becomes is, from my perspective anyway, at this point, a no-win situation. Either we're going to use stimulus money if we are allowed to do that. Remembering, I'm back up for just one minute. Remembering the stimulus money comes to the governor. The governor distributes it. 
It isn't the Department of Education, it isn't anybody else, it's the governor. And the governor makes those decisions. And so that's, that's a major issue for us. So if the governor decides to move some of that to 910, then we can use some of that towards this loss. But if we use it then, we won't have that same money in 10, 11. Because I don't think, several people, several newspaper reporters have said to me, don't you think the government will give you, the federal government will give you more money? My answer has been no, I don't. I think this is the end of the, the end of the funding. And particularly with the battles that are going on in Washington right now, I don't think they're going to open up more money for it. So we're really in, at this point in time, and I, I figure it will be after the 3rd of November, and how much later I don't know, before we have some sense of where we are. There is a piece of it that the legislature could deal with, but the legislators told us the other day they have been not approached by the governor to start their session earlier than January 1st. So they cannot, nothing can be done by the legislature until they're actually in session. And so you've got the governor, you've got the legislature, you've got the stimulus package, and how those are all going to play out, I'm not sure. Which all leads me to, I'm getting near the point, I have to start building a 2010-2011 budget. And I've, I've been working with it, I've been playing with figures, I've been looking and seeing what they are. Uh, but I, I'm not sure what it's all going to look like. And so, and you also have to remember that the budget you're dealing with this year, what I'm spending this year, the salaries, fringe benefits, etc., $699,000 of that is stimulus money. So you can, all, you can picture that as also not in your school budget. So when we close out the school budget, that $699,000 is not there. It is items that I said, if I hadn't gotten 699, I would have cut. But it is not in the money that you have in hand to do those things. So is, I think in, in doing this explanation to you, number one, because the newspapers are so adamant about finding out and getting articles in the paper, and so far have reported me fairly clearly, I will thank them for that. Uh, I think it's really important that I put as much of this on the table as possible. The last piece I'm going to put on is the freeze, because I have had 10,000 questions on what is the freeze. What does that mean? What does it look like? What it means at this point is I cannot freeze salaries or fringe benefits at this point in time. So therefore, I'm paying salaries and fringe benefits as I always have been doing. What I have done is I've frozen other spending. Now, several people have said to me, well, if you're freezing spending, how can teachers teach? Good question, one that I, I don't argue with. So what I do on a daily basis is a pile of purchase orders comes in and lands on my desk. I read every single purchase order. If it is a purchase order that is for funds that are absolutely adamant to continue on in a class, I will approve them. If it's purchase orders that are not absolutely necessary to carry on the work of the schools, I freeze them. Two examples I can give you that are fairly quick examples are number one, libraries in the school system. Each of them has a budget. Each of them usually encumbers the budget at the beginning of the year and then spends it as they need to spend it. I have frozen those budgets. The only thing I'll approve of is anything they can prove to me is absolutely adamant to be used for the classroom at this point in time. That I'll approve. Anything else I'm not approving. So that's, that's one example of, of what I'm looking at. The other one, which is causing a lot of indigestion with people, is co-curricular. Co-curricular programs, as you know, you approve. Uh, we pay people a certain amount of money to do those programs. And many of them have programs which require travel. I am, after, as I look at these, some of them need $1,000 to go here. $1,200 to go here, $800 to go here, $700 to go here, etc. I cannot possibly approve those at this point in time. I, if I'm approving that kind of money, I need to be approving it for the classroom, the day-to-day -day instruction that's going on. So that has caused some, some very nervous, get people to get very nervous because they're not getting that money. But I'm very clear in the fact that no matter how much money I freeze, it is not going to come 
anywhere near $421,000. Definitely nowhere near $800,000. But at least it is some money that we'll have in advance. You do have a contingency account, which is $70,000. But I'm very much aware that we have some programs coming up and some students in need of services where we'll probably have to spend that money. So I, I guess if I, if the, what messages I'm getting out to the public is that number one, we're in very difficult times. We're in very difficult decision times. I am extremely concerned and I'm first to say that and I've talked with Dwight about it so he knows I'm very concerned about this. I may at some point this current school year while we're in session, begin to look at having to cut some staff in order to get the money I need to have. So when Julia says we students want to play a role in this, <laughs> they'll probably get their voice in this as well because it will be very, very difficult decisions that need to be made as we work our way through this process. I'm going to stop at that point. Mainly I wanted to get the baseline message out to you. I wanted you to see how confusing it is with the lack of data we have. I go back to what Peter has told me several times. You can't trust anything at this point. So you deal with what you can deal with and what you know at that point in time. Rebecca. Um, thank you, Alan. I, I hate to make it bleaker than what you've just described, but I have to say that I'm very suspect of the idea that because our property value has declined, um, we are somehow going to be in a better spot next year than this year for several reasons. One, yes, our property value has declined, but so has the rest of the state of Maine. We may have declined at a slightly higher rate, but I just don't see that as being any source of um, compensation to the huge deficit in state funding for education. Um, so I just want to be very clear with the public that um, we're not going to get more money next year. We're going to get less. It's just a matter of how much less. Um, and it's looking really bleak. So I just, I, I, I've actually heard a couple of comments over the past couple of weeks saying, oh, but we're, our, Valuations declining, and, that, and it kills me to say this, but the one time that that funding formula would have helped us, um, it's not going to because the pool of money that that funding formula is, is allocating is 100, 100, probably $100 million smaller than it was last year. And, and I think you're absolutely right. And the thing is, I, I fear that the formula will be changed because of, of the picture of, for all communities, and so probably they'll change the formula at that point. They're certainly not telling us that at this point. It's one of the ways the state's going to balance its budget. Yeah. 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 Alan, will yes. we be, I, I hope that if they do change the formula, that, that we'll be kept abreast of exactly how they're changing it. And um, it, that certainly has been one thing that we, we looked at last year was we did not understand why Yarmouth wound up in such a better position than we did. Um, so I think we had somewhat of an understanding last year, but I, you know, if they shuffle the deck, I'd like to yeah. like to see um, sort of what they're using for a formula. And unfortunately, uh, as you will remember, we don't get the report on what the formula is. I think last year it was April no. before we got the final report, and so these are questions that will be continually asked uh, from superintendents across the state to understand where we're going to be this process. And, and I, I would like to say too, and I, I appreciate what Rebecca said, is I don't like doing these reports and I don't like doing them to the public, mm -hmm. but I think it's important for the public to understand that the answers are not simple answers. That they, they are, we are at a stage now where we don't have a lot of wiggle room in this process. Any other questions, Kathy? Two, two questions. Approximately how much do you think you can um, save by the, by the current freeze? I, to be very honest with you, I think if I can save thirty to 40000 I'll be lucky. Okay. And the second question is, and I know I've known this in the past, but I don't recall, <coughs> approximately how much money are we getting from the state now? We got this last year, and I probably have to look to follow you, it was 2 point something. About 2.1 2 .1 2 .1, million. 2.1, 2.2 million? 2.1, 2, .1, 2, .2, million. Yeah. 2, .1, 2 .2. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? 
I just wanted to um, add or whatever. There is another pool of stimulus money, mm. ironically, in context of this conversation, oh, called race to the top funds. Actually, it should be a race to the bottom. Um, <laughs> however, I, you have to crack a joke. It's so sad. The whole situation is so sad, so I apologize. Um, but that has a lot of doing a little bit of reading on it. I don't know if you want to comment. That ha seems to have a lot of strings attached yep. to those funds. Um, and it's tied up a lot with charter schools, sure. which may or may not make those funds available to us or even any of the other school districts in Maine. Is that correct? At the rate, what is happening right now, there are some grants being written, statewide grants for that. But understanding is we do not allow charter schools. And so the issue will come before the legislature again this year of whether they'll approve them. I think I heard the legislators when we talked to them the last time say it was a fairly close vote last time around charter schools and whether they accepted them or not. So that will be a new issue because that at this point keeps us out of that race to the top. Mm -hmm. Alan, I understand those stimulus funds also have to go through the governor's office. Yes, they do. Yeah. Any stimulus funds go directly to the governor, do not go to the legislature, do not come directly to us, and then he makes, he or she, whoever is governor at that point in time, makes the decision. I still have the fear that the office of the governor is going to keep them all to help balance their own budget. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. Okay, any other questions or comments on finances? The, the, I'll just add one more little piece to this, which I think is going to be interesting. But with Only if it's a good news. Okay, no, it's not. <laughs> with 19 budget, is that I also recognize the fact that these cuts that the governor can make at this point in time across the state, if they go to regional school units that have just been formed, the regional school units, when they formed as a group, and I'll use again, I should, probably shouldn't do it, but I'll use Freeport as the example. When they formed as a new group, any unexpended balance they had had to be returned to the town. So they are at a 0% in amount of money, an unexpended balance. So a town, towns like that, and there are many of them, Freeport isn't the only one, it's the one closest that I know anything about, they are going to suffer a different loss because they don't have any unexpended balance there. To, to work with. Okay. Um, it wasn't that fun. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Um, new business. Consideration of a proposed World Affairs Council trip to Brown University. Jeff, do you, you want to speak to, to that? that you want, yeah. I've got the sheet right here. I have it. Do you need a copy of it, Jeff? No, I, I have it. Is this? Did we talk about? I thought we, we talked about it one more one time earlier, didn't we? I don't think it was. Did we? Didn't we? Yes. It is signed 9/11. I just noticed that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ah, I thought we did. That's why I thought. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we already approved this. I, that's my recollection. Okay. I thought so this was maybe a second reading of. Okay, that was easy. I, I will say, take that off the list. Thank you very much. I, I will say, since I'm here at the microphone, I mean, because I'm one of the ones who's been peppering Alan with emails, because we have more extracurricular activities than a lot of kids do. Um, this trip is in jeopardy, um, because the, the students were have, have always been expecting to bear a, a significant percentage of the cost of this trip, but the school is going to be able to contribute a little bit. Now the school is not going to be able to contribute anything, and the question is, are the parents and families willing to pay the balance to make the trip happen? And just to make that real. Thank you, Jeff. Um, consideration to approve middle school co-curricular and fee, athletic fee positions. Does this also have, I haven't got this one correctly, has this also got the special aid? Yeah, the one from we have Dawn? SST right here on one side and okay, two so, athletic. So I'll do them all at yeah, once. All at once, okay. if you would, that'd be great. So I'll start first with the recommendations for extra extracurricular uh, positions from Dom, and that is Cheryl Joyce, who is to be the SST middle school person at $1,250, uh, and is a school position. It's, uh, uh, and it is marked as new position, no and new hire, no. And I think it was one that was just missed before. Am I correct? And so we need to get that in. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want me to keep on going through middle school? Yeah. At this point in time? Yeah. That, yeah. OK. Yeah. So if you turn the page over, you'll see the one from Scott Labby for extracurricular positions. First one is Joe Doan for his eighth grade boys basketball. 
and the second one is Tony Jones for seventh grade boys basketball. And these are both uh, positions that have been there and they're not new hires in, in, in any case. Uh, let me see, is that all That's the it. middle school ones I have? Yes, it yes. is. Okay. I move that we approve the middle school co curricular and athletic fee positions as presented by the superintendent. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? A second. second. Okay. Go ahead. Mayor. Okay, Mary, any questions or comments? All those in favor? Okay, thank you. Consideration to approve high school athletic volunteer and fee positions. Okay, what I have here is from Jeff Thorak, recommendations for extracurricular positions. I have Mike Curtis, for assistant football coach. He is a volunteer, and this is a new hire as a volunteer. He says at the side, Michael is a Cape Elizabeth High School graduate and a former football player for Cape Elizabeth High School. Michael also played football at Plymouth State College. Michael is volunteering his time coaching this fall. Okay. And yeah. keep so going. Okay. Uh, and the next page is from Jeff Thorak also. Uh, these are extracurricular positions. Uh, first one is Jim Ray for Boston Boys Basketball. I'm just going down through, unless there's a yes, and then I'll stop. Yeah, that. keep going. Aaron Spaulding uh, for Junior Varsity Boys Basketball. Chris Haywood for Freshman Boys Basketball. Doug Worthley for Varsity Indoor Track, Girls and Boys. Marianne Doss, Assistant Indoor Track. Uh, ben Raymond, Varsity Girls and Boys Swimming and Diving. Uh, David Croft for Assistant Girls and Boys Swimming and Diving. Jason Tremblay for Varsity Boys Ice Hockey. Uh, Kurt Brown for assistant JV boys ice hockey, and Eric Wor Worsing is assistant I in JV boys ice hockey. And it looks like on that one, that's a new hire. And funding is other, so I, Jeff, I know you just came in, but that other on Eric, is that other is uh, boosters or something like that for paying for it? No, other people had given up. Other people had given up. Okay. Okay. That's all I need to know. And then, okay, next page, I have John Boucher, who is Varsity Girls Ice Hockey, uh, Shane McDowell, who is Varsity Nordic Skiing, Devin Morrill is Assistant uh, Nordic Skiing, Chris Roberts, Varsity Girls Basketball, Margaret Reed is JV Girls Basketball, Mike Bartley is the Diving Coach, and Sarah Ward is Assistant Indoor Track. And I do notice on the next page that uh, Jeff has given some summaries of some of them who are new in these positions. So Sarah Ward, Shane McDowell, Eric Worsing, Jason Tremblay, and Um are you, I think there's two pages of extra, or there's one more page of extracurricular for the high school. Um, yep, yeah. Mary Page, ninth grade, it's class advisor. Michael, uh, this, is this a new one you just Aaron can't? Cavallaro and Ted Jordan. Mary Page. And so these are the ones you submitted today. You spoke to me about. Okay, so I do have Mary Page, the ninth grade class advisor. I see everybody searching for us. I don't know if yeah, you can. You handed it up tonight. Yep. Okay, so Mary Page, ninth grade class advisor, Michael Curtis, robotics. Uh, Aaron Caballero, I can see this, and Ted Jordan for STP coordinators. I move that we approve the high school athletic and co-curricular fee positions as presented by the superintendent. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? Second. Can I ask a question? Can I ask a favor of the board? Would yes. you please um, separate out Jim Ray from the rest of it? Oh. Um, so I can. Yes. yes. Oh. Yeah. Okay. You want to uh, amend that amend, yeah, I'd like to amend that um, with the exception of Jim Ray uh, for basketball, high school basketball. Okay. Second. And second, Mary. Okay. Any questions or comments? I have a question. Uh, Jeff, on the girls ice hockey, are we still working in conjunction with another school on that program? With Wayne Tree, right? Wayne Tree. Wayne mm -hmm. yep. That is correct. With Wayne Fleet School. So we still have a, this is the second year of our um, co cooperative team with the MPA uh, with Wayne Fleet, Cape Elizabeth, and girls ice hockey. Okay, so and is this the total stipend for the coach or is this just? This is the 
total stipend and um, as same as last year, Wayne Fleet will also be contributing two thousand dollars to the uh, ice hockey would go to our dues and fees, which is our ice rental. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor? Seven zero. Okay. And I'm, I move that we approve Jim Ray as the high school basketball coach as presented by our the superintendent. Second. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Linda. Any questions or comments? I'll recuse Just myself. Recusing. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Um, all those in favor? Okay. Six zero. Okay. I think that's everything on those. Um, then we uh, have I, okay. the have mentors. Okay. And then I have Mary Bruns, uh, mentors for teachers of provisional certificates. Uh, you remember that we did some updates last time, and there's still two more. Uh, Kim Sturgeon, who's to mentor Gretchen Earl McCloy, and Paul Casey, who will mentor Tabitha Glanville for year two. All right, I move that we approve the district co curricular uh, key positions as presented by the superintendent. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? No second. Thank you, Kathy. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? All opposed? Six to one. Okay. Um, we want to, before we go into policy, do we want to backtrack and put Jeff on the spot for the athletics update? Jeff, you could you, would you just, uh, we were looking to see if you could give a brief update of the fall sports and how things have gone. Next time you'll come even later, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a lot warmer in here. <laughs> not much. Um, well, I'm not sure if Jeff spoke to um, our spirit week. I think that was on the beginning. Yes, he did. Um, okay, so I, I won't go into that. The, although there was really good stuff there, so I, I'm sure Jeff did a wonderful job. Um, just real quick, our, the golf team. Uh, competed in the Class B state championship team um, at Natanis in Augusta, and they finished fourth place, and three individuals qualified there, so they'll be competing as individuals at Natanis this weekend. And then our Western Maine Conference um, cross-country championships took place last week, and despite a bus breaking down, uh, we were able to get there and, uh, with a delayed start, but uh, the coaches all gathered and um, agreed to... Um, start 15 minutes later, which is really a nice gesture and um, excellent event as always. Our girls finished uh, placed first in that and our boys finished second. So um, they will, uh, we have a couple more meets here before the state championship um, that they'll be competing in. Um, and still, it is uh, mid-October, but we're still kind of in the midst of regular season. Playoffs will be, generally for most of our sports, will begin. Uh, this is the or next week is the last regular season for um, boys and girls soccer. This was the last week for field hockey. Um, and football still has a couple more weeks to go. Um, they finish on Friday the 30th um, here against Fountain Valley. So um, with this new MPA um, re recommendation with a 50% uh, participation as far as teams entering the playoffs, it has impacted us a little bit. And we're really keeping a, a closer eye on heel points and how um, that's impacting our programs. Because it, with, it, it, for most sports, that's about three less teams qualifying. And um, it makes a big difference. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it does make a big difference, um, especially when we're trying to get into that playoff piece. So uh, we're keeping a close eye on that. And um, hopefully good things will come out for our uh, fall athletics. And then winter athletics will start up. Um, about mid-November, so uh, believe it or not, hard to believe we're mm -hmm. getting down to that point. Any questions or comments for Jeff? Thank you, Jeff. Okay, back to um, consideration to approve the following policies for second reading. Rebecca? Yes, we have um, two policies that are here for second reading. There were no comments submitted to the policy committee, um, so I'd like to... Um, Ask that we approve policy JFABD, admission of homeless students, as it's presented to you tonight. 
Unless you want to take them separately or together? I do separate. <laughs> together on the motion. Okay. <laughs> 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 Okay. Together? You want to do them together? Okay. Okay. And then policy KBF, which is parent involvement in Title I. Also, no comments were submitted to the policy committee and are presented to you this evening. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? No second. Thank you, Mary. Any questions or comments on these policies? Kathy? Um, there's a bunch of notes on here. Will that come on? Yes on the first one. And then on um, KBF on page two, um, third of the way down, there's a parentheses around number. Uh, was there supposed to be a number in yes, there? Was. <laughs> Do we Dominic? know what it was? <laughs> Were you paying attention? <laughs> We're looking at KBF DOM, um, page two. How many in parent involvement three. meetings? in addition to the required annual meeting, which will be held at various times of the day. Do you want a copy of the? Yes. <laughs> it's Title I, so I'm not completely up to date on Title I because we don't have a lot of Title I stuff, but. Does this need to go back to the policy committee so we can put in the right number? Well, you or if, 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 if put in a number. How about 10? How about 10 meetings? At least one other meeting. It's at least, right? Don't have Couldn't any. you say at least Just one we other? We don't have any Title I kids, do we? Okay. No. It's at least. At least one. We don't have any, so you can no. put one. At least okay. opens the door for up to 100 if you want. Sounds good. <laughs> I mean, we don't have any kids. We don't have any money for that. So. Well, I need money, so whatever. So you can put one. Okay. So. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, for catching up. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. All those in favor of the motion on the table with the number one inserted on page two. And the removal of the notes. And the removal. Which is of the notes. yeah, that's standard. That's, okay. Yeah. All those in favor? Seven zero. Thank you. Um, consideration of the following policies for first reading. Okay, we have policy JRA, which is student education records and information, and policy IHBAC child fine. Basically, um, Dominic discovered that these policies were fairly old and that there have been some changes recommended um, by MSMA. So what you see before you um, reflects those changes. <coughs> and um, we're not voting on it this evening. It's just to let you know that these are policies that we will be looking at for a second reading at our next meeting. And if you have any questions or yes, Kathy. Um, JRA says that we adopted it December 2nd, 2008. So it looks well, actually, so I recently, yeah. so has there been some new changes? Sorry. May, may, I will rephrase my statement to say that Dominic reviewed them and found out that there had been some changes that were necessary um, since we had originally passed it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Rebecca. Um, proposed resolution for school board relating to excise tax ballot question. You want to go? Okay, um, this is a referendum that, um, I should back up, uh, as a result of our workshop meeting last month, the board discussed the idea of um, issuing some resolutions about a couple of ballots that are going to be appearing in November and also um, Propose the idea that we um, pass, this re pass these referendums in conjunction with the town council. So I um, communicated with Jim Rowe, the chair of the town council, and Mike McGovern, and Vance with Kayada. Um, and she actually had been working on a referendum for the excise tax um, <coughs> referendum, and that is what you see before you. Uh, I should say that um, 
I just was, I just got some communication from, forwarded to me by Anne, that David Backer is going to be proposing an amendment to this referendum. And basically the referendum speaks to um, the councilors urging elected officials to um, exercise, let me see if I can read this, exercise responsibility for reasonable restraints of spending growth and tax increases to demonstrate that citizen imposed external restraints are not necessary for controlling and spending tax increases. Um, I'm going to present to you the referendum as it was put in your packet without that amendment. Um, These are resolutions, right? Yes, okay. resolutions. I don't, I'm sorry if I'm No, that's okay. Not. I just lost it there for a minute. <laughs> now these are resolutions. Um, and so I'm, I, I present, I'm, I'll be presenting these as they are this evening um, for board approval. So would you, you like so to I'm make sorry. a motion? I would like to propose that the school board approve the um, resolution before us. Um, should I read it, actually, another day? Or would, should we just say that once, if we do pass them, they'll be available on the website? That's what I would say. Yeah. Yeah. On the website yes. for okay. particularly yeah. long. So you want to finish your motion? Did you finish it? I thought I did. Okay. Um, <laughs> Could I have a second, or is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mary. Any questions or comments? So this, from you, what you were saying uh, when you were, these are the same as the town council is looking at? This, this is the same as the town council um, as it's being presented to it, but there's a potential that um, Councillor Backer will be bringing forth an amendment to it, but I do not know. I, I mean, I don't know if the, the council will approve this referendum even as it is here, let alone with or without an amendment. So it's my feeling that we, we as a board should consider this, resol this re resolution as it's presented this evening uh, that Councilor Kayata, Swift Kayata had um, provided to us. And when will they be considering this? Next week, I believe. Next week. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to thank Rebecca Ann and Swift Kaata for the, the work that they did on this. It's fairly clearly sort of delineated for us the, the argument, in my opinion, why we wouldn't want to support either of those things because of how government typically functions, et cetera. So um, I would be very comfortable at this point in time. It will be very helpful when we get it on the website yeah. for people who may have not caught up to mm. anything at this point to be able to read through it. and get some information so they can make informed decisions. Yeah, I would agree. Mary? Um, with that in mind, um, the, Rebecca, I wasn't in favor of you reading them word for word. Um, I wonder if we do want to pull out a few or read part of, of these, particularly um, the resolution statement. Okay. Okay. Um, I think the one I will... Okay. Whereas passage of the referendum would result in an approximately 45% reduction in auto excise tax revenue received by the town of Cape Elizabeth, um, and the ex auto excise tax is the third largest revenue source supporting town general fund operations, providing the town with approximately 1.69 million annually, an amount which would be reduced by 758,000 under this proposal. Um, Whereas to replace this lost revenue through property taxation would require the town to increase its property tax rate by 57 cents per thousand of assessed value. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the school board of Town of Cape Elizabeth, um, that the school board urges, the citizen, urges citizens to study carefully information on this ballot issue and to consider the serious consequences of potential reduced road maintenance, plowing, and other municipal services, or the significant impact of property tax increases both of which could be necessitated by passage of the ballot issue. The undersigned school board members hope that citizens will join us in voting no on the excise tax proposal, which is question number two on the state referendum ballot for November 2009. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor of the motion, which would be to support this proposed resolution? Opposed? None. Seven, zero. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I just say I 
Ellen. But I have yes. the final copies here that you could sign tonight, and then Great. we can yes. get them done tonight. You can start That's, pressing There's them. three copies on the excise tax, so we'll have three okay. copies of that. Okay. Um, also, proposed resolu resolution for the school board relating to the Tabor 2 ballot question. Okay. Um, so, oh my. I am going to try to pick out pieces of this that will. Okay. Whereas since 2005, local governments in Maine have operated under a state law that limits the extent to which the property tax may increase in any given year and that requires the local governing body to vote on a separate article to exceed that limit. Um, where, and whereas this law also imposes expenditure limitations on state government, and whereas the purpose of this legislation was to limit state spending and municipal property tax le levy in an effort to reduce the tax burden on our citizens and reduce Maine's national ranking on tax burden, and whereas since it was adopted it has achieved its stated purpose with current state spending and municipal property taxes both below targeted levels, and whereas this citizen, citizen initiative, also known as Tabor 2, will make changes to the current spending and property taxation limits that apply to all levels of government in Maine, and whereas will impose growth limits on all state spending, including the state highway fund, where the current law places limits only on state's general fund, and whereas Tabor 2 will establish fiscal year 2010 as the baseline year for all future growth in state spending, a year where both the state general fund and highway fund will experience significant revenue declines. Thus, this proposal will lock in state spending at current depressed levels, reflecting the impact of the current recession on state revenues. And whereas current state spending limits are calculated on a cumulative basis, allowing the amount spending, allowing the amount spending is below the limit to be carried forward to future years, thus allowing some flexibility in state spending and providing an incentive to spend below statutory levels, Tabor 2 will base the following year's spending level on that of current year, thus creating a use it or lose it incentive. And whereas Tabor 2 will require statewide voter approval for virtually all tax increases and expenditure increases above the growth limit, a requirement that entails significant additional state and local election expenditures and additional costs associated with its requirement that certain notices and financial information be mailed to every registered voter in the state at an estimated cost of 800000 for each mandated referendum. And whereas the municipal and county level, Tabor 2 also mandates referendum voting to approve any budget that exceeds the municipal or county property tax limit. And whereas it also requires municipalities and counties to adopt a uniform budget format as developed by the state planning office. And whereas both of these requirements will add costs that must be borne by local government and its citizens. And whereas Tabor 2, if approved, will dramatically move state and local government in Maine in the direction of budgeting by referendum, the results of which have become apparent in those states where this has already happened. And whereas it will limit the flexibility of both the state and its local government to react to changing conditions, community needs, and economic conditions and undermine the authority of elected officials to make budgetary and service decisions based on information and depth of analysis unlikely to be undertaken by the average voter. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the School Board of Cape Elizabeth that, for the following reasons, the School Board opposes the so-called Tabor 2 question that will appear on the November ballot and which would significantly moder modify current limits on state spending and on the municipal property tax levy. The spending and levy limits established in current state law have been achieving their stated goal of reducing the tax burden on Maine citizens. The requirement that state spending above the spending limit and most tax increases be subjected to approval by a statewide referendum will increase both state and local expenses and move toward a system of budgeting by referendum which, as shown by experience elsewhere, is an ineffective way to make budgetary and service level decisions. By establishing the current year as the basis from which future state spending increases are to be calculated, state spending, particularly for the highway fund, will be starting from a depressed level reflecting the impact of the current recession. 
Tax policy budgets and service levels are best decided through the core processes of representative government where the people elect individuals and charge them with the responsibility of making decisions based on data, analysis, debate, and public opinion while balancing the need for services and expenditures that address the common good with the ability of citizens to pay for such services. Be it further resolved that we urge all citizens to become fully, fully informed on this proposal prior to the November election by becoming familiar with the language of the proposal and reviewing materials provided by those supporting and opposing this measure. The undersigned school board members hope that the citizens will join us in voting no on Tabor 2, which is question number four on the state referendum ballot for November 2009. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. <laughs> now are you going to make a motion? I move that the school board approve the res this resolution uh, relating to the Tabor 2 budget ballot question. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Kathy. Any questions or comments? I have just one comment. Peter? I just want to remind everybody that these two referendums are statewide referendums, as well as the school consolidation ref referendum question. And there's, I don't think there's enough understanding in Cape Elizabeth, being our town is listed as having the highest per capita and also household income in the state of what it's like to be a resident of other areas. I don't think any of us has an understanding of what it's like to live in a town, a one industry town such as a paper town where the paper mill is closed. Those towns are going to vote very differently from us on all three of these referendums. It's a statewide referendum. I'm still very concerned that the school board has not done enough planning or even held discussions as to what we may have to be forced to do if these three referendums pass. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All those in favor? Seven zero. Thank you um, for all that hard work. Um, letter in support of Maine School Board Association's proposed resolutions to be introduced at the MSBA Delegate Assembly. Um, well, I think we put this on. Uh, I put this on here um, because I the last. At our last meeting, it wasn't clear that anyone was going to actually be attending, and we did not nominate a delegate to attend this meeting. However, they are going to do something similar to what we just voted on, which is to oppose the Tabor 2, <coughs> oppose the tax excise, the excise tax referendum to oppose um, shifting the cost of teacher retirements from the state to local, um, local municipalities, and also to, I guess the fourth resolution is to provide equitable access and funding to gifted and talented programs. I didn't know um, if, since none of us are going to be there, if we wanted to do some letter in support or communicate our stand if, um, if we have a consensus on any of these resolutions. Should we have a motion? I, I, I'm struggling with this. I guess, okay, I'll make a motion to open this up for the discussion. I would like to move that the Cape Elizabeth School Board draft a letter in support of the MSBA, resolu these four MSBA resolutions, which will be voted on at the MSBA Delegate Assembly on October 22nd, 2009. Second. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, now, questions and comments? I just have to say that I, I support these resolutions. Obviously, we just voted on two of them that are uh, uh, two of the, the resolutions that they have. Um, the other one, the teacher retirement cost shift, obviously would just kill, our, our, kill us on the local level. Um, and I think that this is saying fund gifted and talented instruction um, at, a, at an appropriate level. Am I misunderstanding that? Resolution? Wait, you saying? Yeah. You're misunderstanding the agreement that is. Have you read the resolution from from the Main School uh, Board Association? Basically, what they're saying is they want to give us more money for gifted and talented because what we do is we have to fill out a gifted and talented application. And we get money that's kind of. I thought last year we got cash, but we don't. We actually just get taken off our EPS model which is not a lot of money. I think it's like $15,000. So 
this is a ton of work that goes along with gifted and talented. So that's basically and, and it what doesn't include do. AP courses, right. correct? So that, in fact, if a, if they included AP as part of the gifted and talented program, that could help us in terms of funding. Well, and it's also something very basic. If reading through this, is that if it is qualified as gifted and talented, if I'm understanding this, then they also, if there's room, they don't want other students who aren't identified as gifted and talented to be precluded from participating in AP classes, which would underutilize the AP classes and also block out students who don't meet the very specific criteria that have identified them as gifted and talented. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else comment, question, thoughts on this? Okay, all those in favor, all those in favor of the motion? Seven zero, okay. Um, in terms of actually carrying this out, should I draft one paragraph letter, send it around and have Andrew type it up? Okay, I'll do that. Um, okay, thank you. Um, consideration of, to reappoint Carolyn Flaherty and Courtney Thorak as school representatives to the Community Services Advisory Commission. Do you want me to do that? Um, if you recall, and Janet, help me if I screw this up. Um, if you recall, the Community Services Advisory Commission has representatives, or, or the town council and the school board share the responsibility for making appointments to that commission. And um, we have two slots this year that have been um, exemplary, exemplarily filled by Carolyn Flaherty and Courtney Thorak, and we would like to um, renominate them to continue to serve or to serve another term on that. So I would, can I move? I would like to make a motion that we reappoint Carolyn Flaherty and Courtney Thorak as school representatives on the Community Services Advisory Commission. Second. Thank you, Rebecca. Any questions or comments? How long is the term? Three years? Three years. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor? 7-0, thank you. Okay, committee reports. Is there anyone, I'll start on this side and work our way down, who would like to give a report on any um, committee work? No, other than just to note that all of the minutes are pretty much on the, uh, on the website, so I would encourage the public to go read them because a lot of them are pretty lengthy and depth and, and interesting. <laughs> Would anyone like to add to that? Are you going to go over the dates? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, public comment on agenda items. Is there anyone here? Okay. Um, school board agenda requests. Are there any requests for? Okay. Announcements of upcoming meetings. We have a few things. Alan, do you want to do this? Yes. Uh, just quickly, as far as uh, the workshops for the next few months, uh, October 27th of this month, will be the science workshop on science curriculum, November 10th, which is changed from the original date sent out. Is November 10th will be ELA. Uh, December 15th will be world language. Uh, January 22nd, 26th, excuse me, January 26th will be guidance. Uh, February 23rd, we have set aside right now for budget, figuring we'll probably be involved with that. March 23rd will be math. April 27th will be social studies, and May 25th will be to be announced at that point in time. Which then leads me to be sure that if you have at home uh, the capabilities of school board meetings, we have, made, we have had to make a couple of changes. For the workshop meeting, as I just said, it was originally the 17th, it is now set as the 10th of November. And the December 15th, uh, we just want to make sure I'm saying this right. December 15th workshop meeting, prior to the meeting, will be a board organizational meeting uh, to plan for the new board and what they'll be doing, and also the chair, okay, and determining the chair of the meeting, chair of the new board, excuse me. So that'll be on the 15th. 
Okay, the, in the next regular school board meeting is November 3rd. All of these dates will be on the website, right? Yes. Yes, Including the updated <laughs> schedule on the workshop. Um, okay. Can you send them to us as well? <laughs> yeah, you got them once more. We will revise them and send them on to you. Okay. Um, anything else? I think that's it. Is there a motion to adjourn? Thank you, Rebecca. Second? Second. Thank you, Linda. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you.